evening. If you've got your Bibles there, please go ahead and open them up to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Now, the book of Ephesians is a letter written by the Apostle Paul to the church in the city of Ephesus. And Ephesus was a pretty big deal. Now, Ephesus was one of the wealthiest of all the Roman cities. It was one of the biggest tourist destinations of the ancient world. And to this culture, the Apostle Paul is going to bring a message to them about marriage. Now, marriage in Ephesus was something that was not taken very seriously at all. Divorce was commonplace, and adultery was the norm. It was expected that if someone was married, that they would continue to have several partners. And it's into this culture that Paul brings a very different definition of what marriage is. Now, if I were to ask you what your definition of marriage is, what would you say? What is your personal definition of marriage? What's your definition? Do you have it? Here's what we're going to do, okay? The count of three, we're all going to say our definition of marriage. Ready? One, two. No, don't, don't. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Okay. Here's my question, though. Was Christ at the center of your definition? Because listen to what the Apostle Paul said in verse 31. Have a look at it yourself. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31. Paul says this. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Verse 32. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. So Paul here is referring back to Genesis, and he's saying, there's a mystery here in marriage. There is a secret, a hidden secret that's been revealed to me through the gospel, and it's blowing my mind. Keep this in mind, too. Paul is not married. So Paul is not saying, I've discovered this secret about marriage and I'm really excited about it because I'm going to go home and apply it to my marriage. It's not what he's saying. He's saying this mystery that he's found is profound. It's a secret. And here it is. That marriage has always been a picture of Christ and the church. Always. Marriage was created by God in the garden as a picture of Christ and the church. In Genesis chapter 2, God said that it was not good for Adam to be alone, that Adam needed a helper. So why did Adam need a helper? Well, there's probably a few reasons, but here's why primarily. Adam needed a helper because Adam needed someone to serve. Adam needed someone to love. Adam needed someone to sacrifice for, to create a picture of Christ and the church. And so so Paul's like, this mystery is profound. This is what marriage has always been about. It's always been a picture of Christ and the church with the husband portraying the role of Christ and the wife portraying the role of the church. So let me ask you, is that how you think about marriage? When you came into the building this evening, you saw lots of marriages. Did it cross your mind? Hey, look, Christ in the church, Christ in the church, Christ in the church, Christ in the church everywhere. Or if you're married, husbands, is this how you think about your marriage? Did you wake up this morning and remember that you're married, and fall to your knees and say, God, I I just want to portray Christ today in my marriage. Help me. Wives, did you wake up this morning and remember that you're married and say, Father, I I can't do this. Would you please help me to portray the church today in my marriage? Because this is the will of God for marriage, that husbands would portray Christ and that wives would portray the church, because when marriage is done this way, it screams to the world, there's a God, and, and he has a bride, 
that he profoundly loves, and her name is the church. This is why marriage exists. This is why God created it, to be a living picture of Christ and the church. So what's the problem then? Why do so many marriages in the church end up in so much trouble? Well, here's the first reason. It's because so often we aim our marriages at the wrong target because we're aiming them at the target that's all about us and and our personal fulfillment and our personal happiness and our personal desires being met. And this marriage turns into this thing, this endless quest where we're just trying to get our spouses to act the way we want them to because we think that's going to make us happy. Instead of aiming at the right target, by first seeking our satisfaction in God alone and not in marriage, and then pursuing God's design for marriage, which is creating a picture of Christ and his church. That's the first reason why so many marriages in the church end up in so much trouble. Here's the second reason. It's this. It's when we have the right target and we're trying to portray Christ in the church. We have the right target, but we have the wrong power. And we're trying to do it in our own strength. And so how does that go? It goes nowhere. It goes nowhere. Because trying to do marriage apart from the power of the Holy Spirit is this. It's mission impossible. Mission impossible. For a husband to accurately portray Christ in his marriage, he must be filled with the Holy Spirit. There is no other way to do it. For a wife to accurately portray the the church in her marriage, she must be filled with the Holy Spirit. There is no other way to do it. It's only when husbands and wives are filled with the Holy Spirit that marriage stops being mission impossible and starts being mission possible. Which leads us to our first point. You could jot this down. Our first point, which is this. The essential command for every Christ follower, be filled with the Spirit. The essential command for every Christ follower, be filled with the Spirit. Have a look at verse 18. Verse 18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. And so what does that mean? What does it mean here within the context of Ephesians chapter 5? Be filled with the Spirit. Well, first, this is what we need to see. Be filled with the Spirit is a command. It's something that we must do, and not just once, but repeatedly, again and again and again. This this literally translated means keep on being filled with the Spirit. Make this your lifestyle. Keep being filled with the Spirit. It's a command. It's something that each one of us must do, and yet it is also passive. It's passive, which means that it's something that is done to us. We don't fill ourselves. God fills us. So on the one hand, it's a command, do this, be filled with the Spirit. And on the other hand, it's passive because God is the only one who can do the filling. And maybe you're thinking, well, wait a minute. When I first got saved, Didn't I receive the Holy Spirit? Like, didn't I receive all of the Holy Spirit? And the answer is, of course you did. You didn't receive 10% of the Spirit or 60% of the Spirit or 80% of the Spirit. You received all of the Holy Spirit. But here's the question. You and I have all of the Holy Spirit, but does the Holy Spirit have all of us? Because that's what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It means he has all all of us. And so how does that happen? We'll look back at verse 18. Verse 18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Do not get drunk with wine. Now think about that. 
God is using very intentional imagery here. Do not get drunk with wine. How would someone go about getting drunk with wine? Well, first they would need to get wine. And then they would need to drink a lot of it. And then what happens? They, they get drunk. What does that mean? It means that they become under the influence and the control of the alcohol. The alcohol begins to take control of how they think and how they walk and what they say and what they do and not for the better, but far for the worse. So here's what Paul is saying. He's saying, don't be under the influence and control of alcohol. Instead, be under the influence and the control of the Holy Spirit. And listen, this is not a command for some small group of spiritually elite super Christian. Okay? This is a command for all of us, for every Christian. This is normal Christianity. Be filled with the Spirit. Because if we're not, then not just marriage, but the whole Christian life becomes mission impossible because all of the power to live the Christian life flows to us from the Holy Spirit. So how then do we go about obeying this command? Be filled with the Spirit. When I was a kid, I used to leave for summer camp at the end of June and I would return from summer camp at the end of August, every year. Kind of sounds like my parents were shipping me away. Maybe they were. <laughs> but one thing I loved about summer camp was windsurfing. I loved windsurfing. And, and one thing that you, that you figure pretty quickly on a windsurfer is that if you want to go anywhere, you've got to learn how to use the sail. You have to learn how to balance on the board, but then you have to learn how to pull up the sail and position the sail so that it catches the wind. It's not enough just to say to the sail, be filled with wind. You have to learn to position the sail so that, so that it catches the wind, so that you begin to move across the water. And the Christian life really is so much like that. Consider how Luke described the moving of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. Luke said this, Suddenly, there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. A mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Or consider the way Jesus described the moving and the working of the Holy Spirit in John chapter 3. Jesus said this, the wind blows. The wind, it blows where it wishes, and you hear it sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. Again and again in the Bible, we see the working and the moving of the Holy Spirit being compared to wind, invisible and powerful and active. And if you and I want to be filled with the Spirit, if we want to be under the influence and the control of the Holy Spirit, we need to learn how to raise a spiritual sail, so to speak, so that we can, can be filled with the Spirit and move forward in our Christian lives under the power of the Holy Spirit. Because when that happens, the Christian life begins to look something like this up on the screen. See, this guy, he can't go anywhere on his own, all right? So he's positioning his sail, see what he's doing? The wind begins to catch his sail, pulls him up onto the board, and begins to push him through the water. How do we do that spiritually? That's the question. How do we do that spiritually? How do we raise a spiritual sail for the Spirit to fill? Well, here's how. You can jot this down. Here's how. By pursuing a lifestyle of prayer, a lifestyle of faith, and a lifestyle of war. This is how we are filled with the Holy Spirit. By pursuing a lifestyle of prayer, a lifestyle of faith, and a lifestyle of war against sin. This is how we raise a spiritual sail. This is how we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And let's have a look at that first part of our spiritual sail up on the screen. It's a lifestyle of prayer. So here we have our three parts of our sail. A lifestyle of prayer, beginning here with Ephesians 6.18. Praying at all times in the Spirit. If we want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, we need a lifestyle of prayer, praying at all times in the Spirit. Notice praying at all times. 
This, isn't, this doesn't mean like 24 hours a day, but praying all the time, praying every day in the Spirit. Uh, we're praying along the lines of the will of the Holy Spirit from his word all the time. And we're praying for this. Look what Jesus said. He said, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? We need a lifestyle of prayer. If you want to be filled with the Spirit, we need a lifestyle of prayer, and we need to be asking, God, would you fill us with your Holy Spirit? That's the first part of our sale. Here's the second part. It's a lifestyle of faith. A lifestyle of faith. Paul says in Galatians 3.5, he says, Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and work miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Paul is asking a rhetorical question here. He's saying, he's saying, does God supply the power of the Holy Spirit to you because you try really hard to keep the law? Or does God supply the power of the Holy Spirit to you because you're hearing the word of God and believing it? Hearing with faith. And the answer, of course, is God supplies the power of the Holy Spirit to us through hearing the word of God with faith faith, saturating ourselves in the word of God and believing it. That's the second component of our sale in order to be filled with the spirit. It's a lifestyle of faith. Here's the third component, a lifestyle of war, a lifestyle of war against sin. First Thessalonians 5.19 says, do not quench the spirit. Do not quench the spirit. The idea here being don't throw water on a fire. That, that water is going to quench the fire. Do not quench the spirit. Did you know we can quench the spirit? We quench the spirit by pursuing lifestyles of sin. Do not quench the spirit. Galatians 5, 17. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. This is the war that takes place in all of us. Sin is in us and it's saying, go that way, go that way, go that way. And the Holy Spirit's in us saying, go that way, go that way, go that way. And we must learn to give ourselves over to the desires of the Holy Spirit. And what do we do if we don't and we give ourselves over to the flesh? We need to do this. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we want to be filled with the Spirit, we need to have a lifestyle of war, a lifestyle of faith, and a lifestyle of prayer. So let me ask you these three questions. Here's the first one. Are you living a lifestyle of prayer? Are you spending extended periods of time with the Lord in prayer? Is that your lifestyle? Because we won't be filled with the Spirit apart from spending time with God. Second question. Are you living a lifestyle of faith? Are you spending extended periods of time with God in his word? And, and seeking to believe his word when God tells you who he is and when he tells you what he's done for you in the gospel and when he tells you his promises both for today and for all of eternity because we won't be filled with the spirit apart from spending time with God in his word. Third question. Are you living a lifestyle of war against sin? Are you seeking to rid your life of patterns of sin? Are you fleeing temptation? Are you giving yourself over to the desires of the Holy Spirit? Are you confessing sin? Is that your lifestyle? Because we won't be filled with the Spirit apart from making war with sin. This is how to be filled with the Spirit. By pursuing a lifestyle of prayer, a lifestyle of faith, and a lifestyle of war. So if that's how we are filled with the Spirit, then here's the next question. How do I know when I'm filled with the Spirit? How do I know when I'm filled with the Holy Spirit? We'll have a look at verse 18. Verse 18. 
Paul says, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Here are the evidences. Verse 19, Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So here we see four evidences of someone who is filled with the Holy Spirit. Here's the first one up on the screen. It's this. It's love. Love. So the person who is filled with the Holy Spirit is the person who is pursuing a lifestyle of prayer, a lifestyle of faith, and a lifestyle of war. And when they are filled with the Spirit, the Spirit will be working, producing fruit. Here's the first evidence. It's love. Have a look again at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 19. Verse 19, notice. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Addressing one another in psalms. Here's what that does not mean, okay? It does not mean that you're like, hey, how you doing? How you doing? Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. That's just weird, okay? That would be weird. That's not what this means. Addressing one another in hymns is not, hey, high five. Holy, holy, holy. That would be weird. That's not what this is talking about. Addressing one another in psalms means we are speaking the truth of the psalms to each other. We are speaking the truth in love. We are sharing spiritual truths because we love each other. Ask yourself, does that describe me? Am I someone who is speaking the truth in love to others? Here's the second evidence that we are filled with the Spirit. It's joy. It's joy. Have a look back at verse 19, the second half. Notice, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Does that describe you? Do you have a song in your heart to the Lord? Do you have joy in your heart as as you go throughout your workday, as you are going about your tasks, do you catch yourself? Are you just singing a song of worship? Does that describe you? Because that's evidence that you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Here's the third evidence. It's gratitude. Gratitude. Have a look at verse 20. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Gratitude. Giving thanks in prayer. Does that describe you? As you go throughout your day, are you just like, God, thank you. Thank you. Is there just an awareness of what what you deserve? I deserve the wrath of God right now, but here I am, and I've been given everything. Is there gratitude in your heart? Because that's a sign that you are filled with the Holy Spirit. And then the final sign here is this, awe. Awe of Jesus Christ. Have a look at verse 21. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And that term there, reverence for Christ, means the fear of Christ or being in awe of Jesus Christ. This is speaking of the person who has a servant heart, who is looking for opportunities to serve others. And here's the reason, because they are in awe of Jesus Christ. Does that describe you? Are you in awe of Jesus Christ? Ask yourself, does this all describe me? Is there love and joy and gratitude and awe of Jesus Christ in my heart? Am I filled with the Spirit? And I think for many of us here today, including me, all too often the answer would be not as much as I would like to be. Not as much as I would like to be. So then what do we need to do? We need to be filled with the Spirit. We need to raise up a spiritual sail by by pursuing a lifestyle of prayer and a lifestyle of faith and a lifestyle of war because that's when the Spirit will be filling us and moving in us powerfully and producing love and joy and gratitude and awe of Jesus Christ in our hearts. Therefore, the essential command for every Christ follower is this, be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. So question, how does this all relate to marriage? So glad you asked. 
because that leads us to our second point, which is this. You could jot this down. The overflow of the Spirit's filling, wives who portray the church. The overflow of the Spirit's filling, wives who portray the church. Have a look at verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. So here's what we need to see first, because everything in verse 22 rests upon this fact, that in the Greek, verse 21 and verse 22 are not two separate thoughts. They are the same thought. They flow one into the other. So this is how it reads in the Greek. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, wives to their husbands as to the Lord. It reads like this. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, wives to their husbands as to the Lord. So why is that important? Here's why that is important. Because submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, just like that is an evidence of being filled with the Spirit, so is wives submitting to their husbands uh, as to the Lord. That is also an evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit. And here's what that means uh, up on the screen. It means this. It means when a wife is filled with the Spirit because she is pursuing a lifestyle of prayer, a lifestyle of faith, and a lifestyle of war against sin, the Spirit of God will fill her and will work in her producing love and joy and gratitude and awe. And when the Spirit is working and filling and moving, he will then empower wives to live out mission impossible, which is verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. And I know that for some right now, that word submit is like hearing nails on a chalkboard. But here's what we need to see, all right? That biblical submission is actually a beautiful thing. It's a precious thing, and here's why. Because before it was ever a marriage thing, it was first a God thing. Because there is submission within the Trinity. God the Son submits to God the Father. God the Holy Spirit submits to God the Father and to God the Son. And consider this, that without submission within the Godhead, without the Son submitting to the will of the Father, there would be no salvation in this room right now. Without submission in the Godhead, we would all be lost. And so submission is first beautiful because it is a God thing. It originates in the Trinity. But secondly, submission is beautiful because it is also a Christian life thing. The whole Christian life is a life of submission. Uh, verse, verse 21 again says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That applies to all of us, to every single Christian. Submit to one another. Put others first. Serve others because you are in awe of Jesus Christ. That's the whole Christian life. It's a life of submission. And when the church does this, when the church joyfully submits to Christ, it is a beautiful thing. We call that worship. It's a beautiful thing. It is good and it is right because it glorifies Jesus Christ as worthy. It's beautiful to see the church submitting to Jesus Christ and putting that beauty on display everywhere is what verses 22 through 24 are all about. Verse 22, have a look again at verse 22. Wives, Submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. In other words, God's design for marriage is that wives would display the beauty of the church submitting to Jesus Christ by the way they interact with their husbands in marriage. And so what does that look like practically? Well, we begin here with what biblical submission is not. Okay, here's what biblical submission is not. It is not inequality. Husbands and wives 
fully equal, equal in worth, equal in value before the Lord. It is not inequality. It is not fear. It's not a husband who is intimidating his wife and the wife just being okay with that. That's not biblical submission. It's not doing whatever the husband says. It's doing whatever Christ says. It's not following uh, the husband's instructions to sin. It's not, it's not biblical submission. Biblical submission is first to Christ. It's not being a doormat for an abusive husband. That's not, that is the opposite of biblical submission. If, if there's an abusive situation happening, that needs to be brought out into the light. That needs to be brought to the attention of a pastor or an elder or to the police. That is not biblical submission. Biblical submission is not never sharing an opinion. Husbands need to hear their wives' opinions. They need to hear wisdom from their wives. Biblical submission is not a never confronting the husband. Sometimes wives need to confront their husbands in love, in grace. I need Natasha to confront me sometimes. That's grace upon my life. And biblical submission is not never seeking to influence the husband. Wives ought to be seeking to influence their husband for the good all the time. So if that's not what biblical submission is, then what is biblical submission? Well, here's what it is. Biblical submission is this. It's spirit-filled wives voluntarily placing themselves under God's design for marriage by biblically submitting to their husbands as an offering of worship to Jesus Christ. I'm gonna read that one more time. Notice first, spirit-filled wives. It's spirit-filled wives voluntarily not forced, voluntarily placing themselves under God's design for marriage by biblically submitting to their husbands as an offering of worship to Jesus Christ, not to the husband. And so what does that look like practically? Well, it looks like this. A spirit-filled wife will joyfully support and follow her husband's leadership, as imperfect as it is, a spirit-filled wife will faithfully seek her husband's good, especially his eternal good. A spirit-filled wife will be intentional about showing her husband respect. And she will do all of this for the glory of Jesus Christ. And she will do this whether her husband is a kind man or a difficult man. A spiritually mature man or a spiritually immature man a man who is wise or a man who is prone to foolishness. And speaking of foolishness, I'm going to share with you a couple of my own epic husband fails tonight, okay? Epic husband fails. When I say epic, I mean it. I mean it, okay? Epic husband fails. Here's the first one. This happened very shortly after I got saved. So I didn't grow up in a Christian home, a first-generation Christian, reading the Bible for the very first time. I'm just, I'm just inhaling and reading the Bible like four or five hours a day. Every page is a new adventure. I can't believe what I'm reading. I get to the book of Ephesians. I get to chapter five. I get to verse 22. Wives submit to their husbands. I'm like, what? What? I have no idea what this means. I have no idea what biblical submission is. I have a very worldly idea what submission is. I'm just like, you got to be kidding me. This is what God wants to happen? Wow, I wonder if Natasha's ever read this. This is going to change everything. So it wasn't shortly after that that, that Natasha and I ended up in an argument about something. I can't remember what it was. And I say this to my shame, okay? I went and got my Bible, very calmly, flipped to Ephesians chapter five, to verse 22. I said, have you, read, have you read this before? I say this to my shame because that was all about me and my selfish gain. Husbands never, ever do that. The voluntary biblical submission of a wife is a deeply personal act of worship between her and her Savior. It is never something to be demanded by a husband for selfish gain. Not ever. Never. Biblical submission is an act of worship by spirit-filled wives. 
And if you are a wife here today, let me ask you, would you say that you are passionate about living out this role in your marriage as an act of worship to Jesus Christ. Because maybe you're here and you're thinking right now, I want to be in that place, but I'm just not there. I mean, I mean you don't know my husband. He's got issues. <laughs> okay, I hear a lot of that. <laughs> but keep this in mind, okay? That apart from the Spirit, being a wife is mission impossible. It is mission impossible. You can't do it. Apart from the Spirit, you, will, you won't have the desire to do this and you won't have the power to do this, but thankfully, God has given us the solution. He's given us everything we need for life and godliness. Here it is. Be filled with the Spirit. Lift up a spiritual sail by pursuing a lifestyle of prayer and a lifestyle of faith and a lifestyle of making war on sin and he will fill you and produce in you love and joy and gratitude and awe of Jesus Christ and empower you to do what you cannot do on your own. And he will do it for his glory and for the blessing of your marriage. The overflow of the Spirit's filling is wives who portray the church. Which leads us to our third and final point. We know where this is going, right, husbands? <laughs> the overflow of the Spirit's filling, husbands who portray Christ. The overflow of the Spirit's filling, husbands who portray Christ. Have a look at verse 25. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So God's command to husbands is to love their wives as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? Look again at verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, notice, and gave himself up for her. How did Christ love the church? Here's how. By giving himself up for her. And how did he do that? By giving himself up to Good Friday. By giving himself up to being arrested by soldiers. He gave himself up to being whipped with the equivalent of razor blades. He gave himself up to carrying a heavy wooden cross through the streets of Jerusalem. He gave himself up to laying down on that cross and, and allowing soldiers to pound spikes through his wrists and then through his ankles. He gave himself up to being lifted up naked before a mocking crowd and then having his weight slammed down on those nails. He gave himself up to taking upon himself every sin of his church, every sin of everyone who had ever placed their faith in him. He gave himself up to having the wrath of God that his church deserves poured out on him until the sin of his church was paid for in full. He gave himself up to set his church free from sin and death to perfect her and to bring her to himself in glory forever. This is how Jesus Christ gave himself up for his bride. Husbands, with me, look at the cross. Look at the nails. Look at the blood. Look at the wrath. Look at the agony. Look at the sacrifice. Look at how much God loves you. Receive that love with all your heart. Meditate upon it. Beg that God would supernaturally fill you with an understanding of it. And then pour that love out upon your wife. Move through the everyday moments of your marriage asking yourself this question. What does it look like to love my wife right now? And what does it look like to love my wife right now? And what does it look like to love my wife right now? And then do it because you are overwhelmed by the love of Jesus Christ displayed in all that he has done. And what has he done for his church? Look again at verse 25. Husbands, 
love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that, here's the reason, she might be holy and without blemish. Jesus Christ gave himself up to bring about the greatest possible good of his bride. And that is what God commands from husbands, including me, to give ourselves up in every conceivable way to bring about the greatest possible good of our wives. And husbands, if you are anything like me, then you know that you fail at this all the time. Epic husband fail number two. This was 14 years ago, and my wife decided that she wanted to run her first half marathon. And uh, 22 kilometers, and that, that, mar- that half marathon also fell on Mother's Day, and it was her very first Mother's Day. First Mother's Day, half marathon. And she said, Nathan, I need you to do something for me. I want you to meet me at the 11 kilometer mark and give me this water and give me these gels so that when when I get to the 11 kilometer mark, I can eat the gels and drink the water, be replenished to continue in the race. I'm like, yeah, sure, no problem. I can do that. So she takes off. Kilometer three, kilometer four, kilometer five, passing by Gatorade stations. I don't need that. My husband's going to meet me at kilometer 11. More Gatorade stations, more water. Don't need that. Kilometer nine, 10, 11, looking for me, looking for me. I'm not there. Kilometer 12, surely he'll be there. Not there. 13, 14, 15, anger is starting to rise. 16, 17, 18, there I am. I'm like, hey, how you doing? Got your water, got your gels. Guess what she did? She ran right by me. (laughs) Not a happy jogger. Where was I? I don't even know. I don't even know. Distracted, selfish, A couple of months later, it was my wife's birthday. So I thought this would be a really good gift for her. Up on the screen. (laughs) Wives, is that a good gift? Is that a good gift? That is not a good gift. What does that gift communicate? You need some help. That's what it communicates. Epic husband fail. That is not what love looks like. That is not what love looks like. So what does does love look like? Well, up on the screen, it looks like this. Biblical love is this. It's spirit-filled husbands voluntarily placing themselves under God's design for marriage by giving themselves up for the greatest possible good of their wives as an offering of worship to Jesus Christ. That's what it looks like. And where does it come from? Well, it comes from this. Up on the screen, next slide. First, being filled with the Spirit. It's husbands who are pursuing a lifestyle of prayer, a lifestyle of faith, a lifestyle of war, being filled with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit then then producing in them love and joy and gratitude and awe and then empowering them to do mission impossible and to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And they'll do that whether their wives are kind or difficult, spiritually mature or spiritually immature, wise or prone to foolishness. It doesn't matter. Spirit-filled husbands will love their wives because of the love and the joy and the gratitude and the awe of Jesus Christ that the Holy Spirit has worked in their hearts. And so what does that look like practically? It looks like this. Spiritual husband will do these things. He'll pursue friendship with his wife. He will want to be his wife's best friend. He will seek to serve his wife. He will look for opportunities to serve her. He will speak words that build up. He will seek to encourage his wife. He will express gratitude. He will consider all of the things that his wife does for him and he'll go out of his way to say, thank you, thank you, thank you. He will be gentle 
He won't be harsh. He will pray for his wife every day, and he will pray with his wife. He will study the word of God with his wife, not so that he can preach at her, but so he can share the word of God, so he can share the word of God together. He will, he will study his wife. Husbands, can you fill in this blank? My wife feels most loved by me when I... Because that will only come as the result of studying your wife. I need to keep asking Natasha that over and over and over again because I keep forgetting, okay? If you don't know, ask your wife. A, a, a spiritual husband will study his wife. A spiritual husband will ask for forgiveness when he sins. He will be quick to forgive when his, when his wife asks. He will seek the wisdom of his wife. Husbands need the wisdom of their wives. And he will provide for his wife to the best of his ability and he will protect his wife, both spiritually and physically, even if it means he has to die. This is what spirit-filled husbands do. And as I just read that list right now, I'm just thinking, man, I want to be that man. I want that in my life. <clears throat> husbands, I hope you do too. So what happens when a spirit-filled husband lives like that? Well, look at verse 28. Verse 28. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. So here's what Paul is saying. He's saying when a spirit-filled husband loves his wife, in a way, he's loving himself. Not selfishly, uh, but in a godly way. Because as he loves his wife, he's pouring into his marriage and he's blessing his wife, which in turn will end up blessing him. So husbands, are you passionate about playing the role, portraying the role, owning the role that God has given you in your marriage. And maybe you're here right now and you're thinking, man, I would love to be in that place. I would love to want that, but I'm just not there. I mean, you don't know my wife. She's got issues. <laughs> Again, I've heard that before. Keep this in mind, okay? Apart from the Spirit, being a husband is mission impossible. We can't do this, husbands. I hope you know that apart from the Spirit, we won't have the desire to do it and we won't have the power to do this. But thankfully, God has given us the solution. It's be filled with the Spirit. Lift up the spiritual sail of a lifestyle of prayer and a lifestyle of faith and a lifestyle of making war on sin and the Spirit will fill us and produce in us love and joy and gratitude and awe of Jesus Christ and empower us supernaturally, to portray the role of Christ in our marriages more and more and more for his glory and the blessing of our wives. Amen? Amen. We'll close here, right where we began with Paul uh, revealing to us this profound mystery he discovered, this awesome secret that God revealed to him about marriage through the gospel with verse 31. Paul says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying it refers to Christ and the church. And in light of that awesome truth, verse 33, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. And how do we do that? There's only one way. We must be filled with the Spirit. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Well, let's pray. Let's pray. So, Father, you've commanded us to be filled with the Spirit. God, would you cause us now to surrender to your will? Would you work supernaturally and powerfully in our hearts right now that we would pursue a lifestyle of prayer. God, there are some here today and you've been speaking to them for a long time 
about pursuing a lifestyle of prayer. Holy Spirit, would you bring about surrender to your will? Would you bring about surrender to your will about pursuing a lifestyle of faith? Again, there are many of us here tonight and Spirit, you've been speaking to us for a long time about getting serious about being in your word. Would you work surrender in us tonight? There are many of us here and we've been walking in patterns of sin. Holy Spirit, you've been calling us to repentance. Would you work in us tonight and bring about surrender to your will that we would live a lifestyle of war? Holy Spirit, would you fill us? Would you fill us? And would you bring about love and joy and gratitude and awe of Jesus Christ in our hearts. And for those of us who are married, would you empower us to live out mission impossible for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.